Morning, everybody. You know, since we are, we're having the Feast of the Assumption today, I've spent the whole week just reflecting on the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus. What an interesting life she led. From the little bit that we know about her upbringing, Joachim and Anne, her parents, were very faithful Jews, and they raised Mary to be a very faithful Jew. And her Jewish faith grounded her life. But no matter what kind of upbringing she had, no matter what type of religious raisin she had, nothing could have prepared her for what happened to her life, and especially when she was a teenage girl, just 12 or so years old, when she was visited by an angel, a messenger from God. She was already betrothed to Joseph when This teenage girl was visited by the angel, this message from God, and not just any angel, it was an archangel, the archangel Gabriel. You know what Gabriel means? Gabriel means the strength of God. Gabriel was the strength of God, angel. Now in the Bible, when people saw an angel, their response was to fall on their faces in wonder and fear and awe because angels reflect the great glory of God. So think about being visited by the strength of God, archangel. What must that have been like? And then Gabriel, this strength of God, angel greets her by saying, Hail, favored one. That's how Caesar was greeted. Can you imagine... Can you imagine what she thought? Can you imagine what was going through her mind? St. Luke does the best he can to tell us what was going on in his mind. He uses a Greek word meaning troubled, perplexed, greatly agitated, incredibly disturbed. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that felt like? Sensing her fear, the strength of God, Archangel tells her, don't be afraid, you've found favor with God. In this situation, I don't think it eased her discomfort at all, nor did what the Archangel tell her next. You're going to conceive a child by the Holy Spirit. Well, that's certainly different, isn't it? And you're going to name him Jesus, which means God save. And by the way, he's going to be the son of the Most High. Well, that's different too, isn't it? Could you imagine what she felt? And then the strength of God angel tells her more. Your son is going to be given the throne of King David and that kingdom is going to have no end. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what she thought? Can you imagine what it would be like for a 12-year-old girl to have that type of experience? And then there were the rumors about her pregnancy, the murmuring. You know how Huey humans like to murmur and raise stuff up. And there was the great anxiety of how Joseph would take all of this. Can you imagine a young teenage girl going through all this? Then there was all the strange things surrounding his birth, Jesus' birth, the strange visitors, the flight into Egypt. Can you imagine a young girl going through all of this? And when she presented Jesus back to God at the presentation, she had no idea what that would mean. I give him to you, God. And that strange response of Anna and Simeon. Can you imagine what was going through her mind? Can you imagine the great joy it must have been for her to raise a son like Jesus? How proud she must have been. What a delight he was to be with, to play with him, to teach him and to pray with him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it must have been like? But she also picked up like only a mother can pick up that there was something really different about her young son. In many ways, he just wasn't like the rest of the young boys running around Nazareth When he was 12 at the Passover celebration, remember, he stayed behind. He didn't travel on up to the Galilee. He stayed in Jerusalem, and where did they find him? 
with the greatest scholars of Judaism. That's where they found him. Something a little bit different. The strange start to his life. And now this. Mary pondered this in her heart. And when he was 30, her son, he left home, unmarried, practically unheard of in that culture. And he started this strange ministry. He gathered disciples around him and started traveling around preaching. And he started preaching really strange things, preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand and it was coming through him. How strange. And her son said he was forgiving sins. And then he performed miracles. And he started acting like he was the Messiah. There's one point in the Gospels where his family was so upset at him because he was acting so crazy that they came to get him to tie him up and take him back home. He was making a spectacle of himself. Can you imagine what the young Mary was going through? What was going through her mind, what she must have felt? But she was his mother. She knew him like only a mother can know him. She knew his goodness. She believed in him. And then, then there was the great, great sorrow, the grief, the pain. As she witnessed her son's arrest and being mocked and tortured and crucified and destroyed, can you imagine what she was going through? And all that grief and sorrow and pain wiped away, turned into joy when she saw her son raised from the dead in a glorified body. Can you imagine her trying to put all of this together? And can you imagine how she felt when Jesus ascended into heaven? How perplexed and then a little lonely, I'm sure. Just think of all the ups and downs of her life as the mother of Jesus. Can you imagine? As I reflect on her life, there is a constant theme that permeates it throughout. It's her trust. It's her trust in God. It's her trust in Jesus. Even though she could not have understood all that was going on with her and her son, she trusted. Mary trusted. Mary trusted. That runs through her life. Now I want you to imagine this. Her story, to a certain degree, and certainly in kind, is meant to be our story too. Her story, in a different degree, but in kind, is meant to be our story too. It's all part of our grand story. She's our prototype. She's our model. Just like her, guess what? Just like her, we're chosen too. We are chosen to play a specific role in God's grand story, in God's plan of salvation for the world. We are part of that story to be part of that new creation. We are chosen. You are chosen. I am chosen. And just like Mary, we're called to trust God completely and to trust Jesus too. Even though we certainly don't understand the ups and the downs of our lives, and many times we don't understand or don't see God's grand plan, but we trust. We trust. We trust. And we too are the temples of the Holy Spirit. We can be full of grace, God bearers, as we participate in the coming of God's kingdom, full of the Spirit, to show the world there's a different way of living, to show the world there's a different way of being. And we too, just like Mary, we're to stay close to Jesus, close in prayer, in the Word, and in the Eucharist. Brothers and sisters in Christ, her story is ours. To be part of the new creation. Isn't it so fitting that her body was assumed into heaven? Isn't it fitting with how she trusted God completely and cooperated with grace so completely? 
her body not decaying, her body with her son's glorified body in heaven. She's whole. She's whole. That's our destiny too. That's the destiny of our bodies. When Jesus comes again, and he will, when Jesus comes again, And if we have already passed away, then our bodies will be reunited with our souls. And then we'll be whole. We'll be transformed and we will be with Jesus. Her story is our story. That's what makes this solemnity so great. We study her life. We study her destiny. Even what happens to her body. Her grand story is part of God's grand story, which is part of our grand story. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? So we can say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with me. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus.